Welcome back to Count Me In. In this episode, we have the privilege of interviewing Yerbal Orembaev, who shares his extraordinary leadership journey and the impactful lessons he's learned. Yerbal's experiences range from serving as Deputy Prime Minister of Kazakhstan to transferring the Yusin Bank from near bankruptcy to achieving $1.2 billion in profit. Throughout the episode, Yerbal sheds light on the crucial decisions and strategies that were pivotal in leading the bank to success. His insightful advice on leadership, vision, investing in people, and embracing failures provides valuable lessons for aspiring leaders. Join us as Yerbal shares his invaluable wisdom and experiences on navigating crisis and driving change. Yeah, bro, we're really excited to have you on the podcast, and I'm just really excited to chat with you about your your leadership journey and the different uh, paths you've taken. And you've had quite the leadership journey. And what drew you to the different positions that you've taken, and what lessons? What are some of the lessons you've learned along the way? Uh, Adam, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my experience about Jusan Bank story uh, with you with your program. I worked for the government uh, of Kazakhstan for quite a long time. Uh, I resigned in 2015. Before that time, uh, before my resignation, uh, I served as uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and handled uh, economic uh, and then social responsibilities. And uh, in 2018, when I was already with the private sector, working on my own uh, business, uh, I received an invitation from the university, which asked me to help them to set up uh, the investment uh, division of the endowment fund. So it was a very exciting proposal. I believe they, they uh, decided to focus on me and then send this invitation to me because uh, uh, during my time with the government, I served as a board member of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, the board member of the Agency for Supervision of the Financial Organizations. Uh, I also successfully uh, set up a Western-type university uh, in Kazakhstan, so, so a lot of the people knew me very well. So, so they said, okay, why not? After one successful story, one successful project, uh, let's offer him uh, this opportunity. Uh, so, so in 2018, uh, I started uh, uh, this uh, journey, the Jusan Bank with other banks, and I had this great opportunity to create the investment division of the endowment fund. So this is how I started my, my journey, this particular journey with the uh, Jusan Bank, with, with its restructuring, uh, creating a new business model based on the ecosystem. I, uh, in terms of the lessons, uh, actually it was very interesting and enriching experience. And then I, I learned very valuable lessons. Very, very. Uh, one of them that uh, you should really understand your business and then your customers. And then, in, uh, and then currently, you know, there is a great shift uh, all over the world uh, uh, in terms of the customer's behavior. New technologies like AI, digitalization, uh, increased uh, computational capacities, uh, uh, and also the new generation of customers. Uh, they, they have completely different preferences. So, so these two trends kind of change the whole landscape. Uh, so, so you have to understand uh, your clients, you have to understand uh, uh, your business within out, uh, new your customers, uh, because if you don't know, you cannot lead and you, 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 you cannot kind of restructure or do some right things uh, uh, without this really deep knowledge and, and, and uh, 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 understanding uh, the, 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 the main, main uh, foundations of your business. Uh, uh, the second lesson I would say that uh, 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 dream big. What, what, what I learned that uh, in reality with, with uh, uh, great vision, with the right team, with the right strategy, with the right implementation plan, uh, uh, you can achieve a lot. So, so, so dreaming big is, is very, very important. The third lesson I would, I would say that always have an exit strategy especially when you're dealing with the big structures. Together, the whole system, I managed at, uh, about 10,000 employees. So this is quite big. So the, the price of the mistake could be very high. So, so you should be very careful, but you cannot stop development. You're still, you have to still innovate. You still kind of should align uh, your business uh, product services in line with, with the current demands. So, so you should innovate. You should do something new. 
So, so but, but exit strategy is very important. This is your hedge that makes sure that the whole structure won't collapse if something goes wrong. So this is very important. Trust your team. I think team is very, very important. The, the quality of the people you're working with, uh, their, their professionalism, their ethics are very important. But so, so as soon as you set up your team, you, you know that you can trust your people, just let them perform. And in the banking uh, sector, this is more important than even others because teamwork is incredible. This is very, very important. I, I didn't see a person who can just in one phase cover all requirements of the banking. You need a strong CFO. You need a strong risk manager. Uh, uh, you need strong uh, chief information officer. So, so you see, this is very, very complex. And then, and then you have together compile the team of the professionals who can work together, who can share the same vision, who has very good ethics. Only with this one, you can proceed. So this is a very important lesson. If you are sure about your team, uh, don't start because alone you cannot perform. You cannot achieve. So, so I would say this is very, very uh, uh, important lessons I learned from my, my uh, journey with, with the Rusan. I think those are some amazing lessons. And, and maybe as we have this conversation, we'll be able to kind of see how you came to those lessons as you, as you turn, as we kind of talk through that journey. So when you, like you first stepped into that challenge, they said, Hey, we want you to bring you on the Yusin bank. You know, what was the atmosphere? Like, what were some of the challenges and the immediate hurdles that you saw that you had to jump over as you, as you started that, that new part of your journey? This is actually was very, very interesting. So when I took the reins of the bank, the situation was pretty horrible. So I had a feeling like uh, staring into the abyss. i just give you one example. The bank's auditors, KPMG, they came to us after we purchased uh, the bank and then told us that they won't be able to produce any audit report because they said we just, we have access to the accounts, but accounts so mass, uh, documentation in such a mass. So, so we, we just even cannot interpret them and the bank did not have people to, to can interpret and work on this one. So, so can you imagine? So 2018, uh, the year they audited was completely a failure. And according to the regulation, it still proceed because the public, the regulator would like to know. Uh, so, so this is one of the examples how, how the bank was managed. So in terms of the business and the morale of the employees, uh, it was uh, a complete mess. Two years worth of the efforts uh, by the government and the bank administration failed to, to turn things around. So it seemed like uh, the hope was completely lost. So this is was kind of the overall landscape and then the atmosphere, environment at the time we entered the bank. And then we faced, I would say, major three challenges. The first one is the lack of the professionals. So we had to find... Uh, and then we didn't have a lot of time to search for people, but we, we went to address this issue almost immediately. Uh, so to fill in, uh, filling the gap in terms of the management was very, very important. So we successfully did it. Those are some amazing challenges that you had to face. And I can only imagine what it took to kind of gain the trust of your employees. And how did you navigate those waters of gaining trust, stakeholders, employees, customers, trying to trying to win back? Because getting an audit like that from KPMG and having to turn that around and turn the company around is not is not an easy task. So what what steps did you take to try to gain that trust from your from your team? First of all, clear communication. So, so you should be uh, as transparent and honest as possible because in this critical situation, uh, this is mostly was a crisis, crisis management. You should be communicating almost daily, uh, which, we, which we did. Then we also came up with the smart strategy, uh, which we called uh, quick successes. So we wanted to demonstrate that, okay, things are in terrible uh, shape, but, but that we were able to produce even in the short run some, some positive outcomes. So, so we came up with this uh, strategy of the short successes. Within three, four months, we already produced new products. We produced even some small uh, app, which addressed uh, the, the, the disadvantages uh, of this bank. So, so it was very, very successful. Doing this, we also bought some time to focus on our longer strategy. 
restructuring, uh, recovering from the junk assets, uh, and then, and then uh, in parallel building our ecosystem model. Uh, so, so this short success strategy helped a lot. Now, there's something you mentioned, uh, the ecosystem model, and from I, I remember reading about that, and it's not something that not everybody appreciates in the baking sector. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the, what the ecosystem model is and some of the challenges and criticism you face with implementing it, because I know not everybody is a fan of that type of model. The ecosystem uh, models, uh, they're about bundling different services, traditional banking services with uh, non-banking services. So, so you, you, you bundle them uh, and then introduce uh, on some digital uh, platforms. So, so in the nutshell, this is uh, kind of the, the essence of this model. Behind this business model are two trends. One is the change preferences. So the new generations, they don't like the, the traditional way of banking. So, so with the introduction of the smartphones, everybody kind of they spent most of the time over there. So that they would like digital way of interacting with the banks, receiving loans, making payments. So the new generation, the kind of the drivers, of this trend. And the second one, of course, the increased computational capacities, which allow these things happen on the digital platforms. And then the first year we introduced it, uh, this model, we actually started implementing at the end of the 2019. And then 2020 was the most uh, busiest year in terms of the implementation, introduction of this. That there are our branches, uh, branches over the country. And then the Rusan Bank used to have more than 150 branches uh, across the country. The business model of these branches changed significantly. So we initially we introduced People mostly visited our branches to learn how to use our app and then how to use our browser. So we just trained every day our customers and they, they came by themselves. They just wanted to use it, but they had some reservations or some questions. So mostly we spent. By the end of the 2020, we, we saw that we don't need any branches anymore because people stopped visiting branches. <laughs> so, so, so we kind of the, managed to rationalize the, the, the whole system of our branches and then which we ended up with a lot of the savings, actually. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was used to kind of take the bank from how banking has always been done to modern banking, which is kind of what you kind of see now today. I, I don't know. I can't remember the last time I was at a branch for my bank. It, it's probably been a year or so since I've been at a bank. Yeah. So I think everybody's kind of used to that now. But, you know, 10 years ago, you did everything at the branch. And so it shows how much the sector has changed so much. But it, it, it was obviously very successful. Absolutely. It was very successful. Uh, it was very reasonable to do. It was the requirements of the time. But but the time we implemented, it was still uh, emerging. So now it's more less established, at least in Kazakhstan, in the former CIS countries, in, in the China. In nutshell, the banking still is the same as traditionally we understand it. This is the intermediary which accepts deposits and then uh, makes loans. Uh, and then facilitate transfer the savings into productive investments. But the way how you do it, completely different. I mean, that's amazing. And and just it's public record, but you guys were at near bankruptcy and it went to up to like $1.2 billion in profits. And that's no small feat. And it took a lot of leadership decisions. And, I, and the leadership positions that you've been in, I'm sure that there are moments of very intense pressure. And maybe you can share some of the, you know, specific high stake decisions that you've had to make and how you approach those decisions, because not everybody is built to make those high stakes positions, uh, decisions, especially in intense situations. And it's, it's very difficult to, to walk through that. So I'm, we'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your insight. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I, I think this is a very good question. So to make this transformation successful, at the beginning, we split the bank into the bad and the good divisions. Because we dealt with some great garbage, I would say, a mess. So, so how to deal it? So we decided to split uh, the, the, the good part and the bad part. And actually, when we uh, implemented this exercise, and then we set up two different uh, teams. So one team was focused on the bad bank. So, so the main purpose was the recovery uh, of the assets over there. And the, and the good banks team was focused on the new model uh, ecosystems, bundling services, digitalization, and then this, this perspective stuff. And actually, when we implemented it, 
uh, we uh, we uh, 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 run this exercise through all our clients. And then guess how many clients ended up in the good and the bad bank? Only two clients, existing clients from corporate clients, they ended up in the good bank. So can you imagine? And, and this used to be the second biggest bank in terms of the corporate financing in Kazakhstan. So the most clients went uh, to the bad bank. So this is, I think, systematically was the most important decision because it's allowed us to focus on different priorities. Uh, what I found out, it's impossible to eat at the same, simultaneously focus on, on, on these two, in a way, contradictory tasks, at, at least in terms of the one team. So this split allowed us to create the framework to proceed. And then uh, what is important, uh, we proposed non-restructuring policy, which is, was very, very important. It meant that uh, the board of the directors said no to any form of the restructuring other than the early repayment. Given the Kazakhstani banking practices, it was very, very new and innovative because it uh, was a strong stand against any type of the corruption and then, uh, uh, and ensure that everything is transparent. At the first, most of the borrowers, they, they, they tried their luck with us. So they, they tried to approach us. They, they offered uh, some proposals, trying to bend this rule, which is pretty common in Kazakhstan. And, 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 and restructuring may have a very tricky forms. So, so you may just increase for another 10 years uh, tenure of the loan. You may say, okay, uh, given the situation with the business, let's lower the interest rate or make payments by the end of the maturity or not, not monthly, but, but let's say uh, in once in six months or by the... So it was very, very tricky. It looked very reasonable on the surface and then you always can justify uh, why, why you're doing this one, but you end up with the corruption. So, so we, we, we said and we agreed uh, on the decision makers on the management side that no way, uh, because if you if you do one favor to somebody, then you cannot control. And then as soon as you restructure and somehow involved in this type of the questionable type of the practices, then uh, a borrower knows that he might not return because he's some in a way in the agreement with the bank. They have this kind of the friendly relationship, and uh, so it was very important. Uh, so we said no to these practices, and surprisingly, it worked. After people realized that we are not, we we meant this business, they mi miraculously found some resources to repair the loans. Because we told them, either stick to the agreements and then we didn't sign this. We were new people here. You signed it before with the previous administration. So, we're, so either to stick to this one or repay and leave us, or if we found that you, you're doing wrong, you're defaulting, we bring you to the court. Uh, and then we'll proceed with the bankruptcy or, or other uh, type of the legal cleansing. So, so most of them prefer to, to repay and leave us. They said, this is something. And then my, my team we ended up with a lot of attention with some people, which we perceived uh, as friends, politicians, judges, members of the parliament. So, so they, they, they said, okay, you personally uh, didn't like us. So, so this is nothing to do with personal. <laughs> but this is just the corporate policy. But, but somehow it worked and then people respected it. They understood that this is the way to do business. We did it transparently, we announced it, and then we stick to this one. We, we, we meant it. And then we never allowed this type of the restructuring. We hired young professionals, as I mentioned, it was very important because some of them traditional bankers, even uh, in the younger stages, they opposed many changes, particularly artificial intelligence initiatives, this type of the restructuring I explained to you, we hired some professionals, maybe even not with the banking background, but with the financial, particularly from telecom industry. We found a lot of the uh, great people. Then we also restructured the whole organizational uh, structure. And this is a, was a very big change. Uh, just to give you a flavor, uh, we had more than 150 branches uh, across the country, we ended up with the 119. So almost one third we managed to optimize. It was a lot of the savings. Just bank by itself employed about uh, 5,000 people. We also managed to downsize. Uh, we had 2.7 million individual clients, so, so customers. So, so you have to, when you restructure, when you set up a new organizational structure, you should be very careful not to lose them. And then uh, about 176,000 small and medium enterprises. 
So, so it was kind of the big uh, restructuring. It's not the final list, but but just to, to illustrate. No, I appreciate that. And and you had to make some really tough calls, especially when it comes to downsizing and restructuring. And it, it's difficult, but based on the success of the bank, you know, they were the right decisions and it's not always easy to make those decisions. Um, and maybe as we wrap up the conversation, you can kind of offer just some advice for people who are saying, you know what, I'm looking to get into leadership roles. And sometimes leadership roles can be very challenging, especially in business environments that you're restructuring things, you're trying to change up things. And maybe based on your experience, you can give just some advice to folks who are listening to this and saying, you know what, if I find my little situation, I can apply some of the lessons that you learned. Uh, this is a great question. And then just uh, to, to, to bring one example, you have to be ready if you start this journey. When things go fine, they're okay. Usually uh, this is because of your boss and the board of trustees or the management board. But when things go wrong, usually it's on you. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> you have to be ready to accept it. Uh, somehow it's unfair, but this is the reality. So this is kind of the prerequisite for, for somebody who would like to travel. In terms of the lessons in term, uh, for, for leadership uh, and successful implementation, you need to, to have a vision, a strong vision. And you have to, based on the knowledge uh, of your business customers, if you don't have this vision, uh, don't start your journey. Uh, this is very important. It's not sufficient. Uh, as soon as you have your vision, you have to clearly communicate and then build a shared vision, both with your employees, with your team, top managers, and also articulate this one to the customers. It's very important. It's in a way like, like you know, the, the social contract in the words of the uh, French philosopher Rousseau, uh, Rousseau which, which around this one you can build something. But if there is no vision, if it's not shared, with your team, you you kind of doomed to, to, to fail. So, so to create this vision, actually, we created, set up uh, Jusan Club. And then the Jusan Club was very instrumental. Uh, it was the uh, monthly gathering of executives. So that we could informally discuss, share our success stories, learn from each other. And this way, you, you create this one. It's not like words people read, but people are usually very skeptical. Uh, you need some examples. You need some informal type of the communication, which make them believe into what, what you are saying. Uh, and then when peers share, this is very important, both mistakes uh, and then, then successful stories. Investing in the people very important. It is particularly in our case, because it was in a way completely new business model based on the new technologies, the digitalization. Uh, so we introduced the chief learning officer she got a PhD in education from Cambridge University. So, so she was very successful uh, in terms of the assessing needs and training the whole staff based on the different levels. And we even set up two educational centers to, to uh, train our own IT personnel. In IT, mostly you need some writers of the Python or some coders. And you don't need uh, uh, most of them to be a bachelor or master's degrees from universities. Of course, we tap potential of our university. So, so the, the, we stayed first in the line uh, in terms of the, our com uh, computing schools graduates. So we hired most of them, particularly for the IT department. But in the lower value added activities, you usually don't need this qualification. So you need somebody even after high school with the good uh, skills in the mathematics. So you just train them. And then usually three, six months is sufficient. So we set up, uh, and then it's very difficult to find them in the market, actually. So, so we trained our IT personnel by ourselves. So learning, investing in the people is uh, very important. Clear KPIs, very important. Try to keep, uh, stay away from the shadow zones. Try to articulate them as clear as possible. Leave no room for uh, misinterpretation address all this gray area because this is your contract and this is what your expectation. So people must be very clear in terms of the expectation, in terms of their duties. Embrace failures. It's inevitable in such type of the new disruptive models. Nobody did it before. So, so, so you experiment usually. So, so don't be very tough on the people. They're learning because you are learning too. So learn from their failures and then mistakes. Don't, don't punish. A talent focused. I used to have a rule 
uh, which called 90 days. Usually three months is sufficient to understand because some resume, sometimes reading very difficult to understand whether it's artificial intelligence prepared it or people somehow in the fancy way prepared it. But unless you really try them in the field, so usually 90 days is sufficient to understand whether the person can deliver. Usually if you have some doubts, I, I provided another 30 days, but by, by, by six months it will be sufficient. So, 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 and then and you have a clear understanding uh, uh, whether you're okay with guy or not, or maybe you did the wrong decision in terms of their qualifications, so maybe just to send to, to other division. But, but if not, if it doesn't work, allow this person leave or do something else. Motivation is very important. Focus, focus is people can perform when, when they're kind of there uh, on the stage. It requires a lot of the attention, uh, which you cannot do all the time. So, so monitoring on monitoring, building the system of incentives. So that this is part of the culture, new business culture, very, very important. So, so they understand right signals. They know how to proceed. Monitor incentives also very important. And then hard work, there is no substitute for the hard work. There is no silver bullet. As long as you understand your business, you have a great team, then the hard work is indispensable. So this is kind of the, in the nutshell, the lessons in terms of the leadership I, I learned and uh, wanted to share based on the Rusan story. And I think people can learn something from this. I agree. And um, your boy, I just want to really thank you for sharing your story on our podcast. And I know that the audience can learn so much and, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for this opportunity to share my experience. And thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.